Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Tupperware Bands Corporation fourth quarter 2020 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Now, I'd like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Jane Gerard, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Welcome to Tupperware Brands' fourth quarter 2020 earnings conference call. With me on today's call are Miguel Fernandez, our President and CEO, and Sandra Harris, our Chief Financial and Operations Officer. Earlier this morning, we issued a press release announcing our financial results for the fourth quarter in the December 26, 2020. The press release is available on our company website on our Investor Relations page. We will begin with our safe harbor statement. During the course of today's call, we will make forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties as described in our press release and in our SEC filings. You should listen to today's call in the context of that information. We will also discuss some of our results for the quarter on a non-GAAP basis. Reconciliations between GAAP and adjusted measures can also be found in our press release. Any reference to sales in this discussion today is referring to local currency sales which compares results between periods as if current period foreign exchange rates had been the exchange rates in the prior period. You can access the release and our forward-looking statement language through the Investor Relations section of the company website, where you can also access a webcast replay of this call later today. I will now turn the call over to Miguel for his remarks. Thank you, Jenny, and good morning, everyone. In 2020, we started down a path to modernize the company. Let me summarize key wins for us in 2020. We right-sized our business with gross cost savings in excess of $190 million. We revamped our leadership team and reorganized the company. We strengthened our balance sheet, improved cash flow, and restructured and refinanced our debt. We initiated a new growth strategy to unlock the power and consumer acceptance of our brand. And we started executing on our new defined purpose to nurture a better future every day, putting our environmentally friendly, reusable message front and center. As a result of this performance, we have now achieved two quarters of improving performance on our way to turn around the company. With sales growth of 20% in the last two quarters, we believe we've changed the negative trends of prior years. COVID-19 was an unexpected disruption that we all had to deal with in 2020. On the negative side, we estimate a negative top line impact of about 62 million due to forced closures and other restrictions. But on the positive front for us, we see a new consumer trend emerge around the world. In 2020, more people have been staying home due to the pandemic, which led to more cooking at home, more time in the kitchen, and more of a of an awareness to prepare food, minimize food waste, and decrease their use of products made with single-use materials. Top of our products were a solution to these consumer needs. To overcome the restrictions related to the global pandemic, our sales force accelerated their adoption of digital tools and methods. As a result, they were able to modernize how they reach and service their customers and how they demonstrate our innovative products. A key strategic shift for us in 2020 was that our sales force realized that geography was no longer a hindering factor in growing their business. By utilizing social media platforms and digital tools, they've been able to reach beyond their physical neighborhood and leverage the expansive reach of their online social network. While it is still early in the transition to embracing digital selling tools and methods, we're confident we can build upon the success game in 2020 and accelerate widespread adoption in 2021. We believe a more digitally equipped sales force will enable greater engagement and increased productivity as we move forward with our other growth initiatives. Let me highlight a few of our key markets. In the U.S. and Canada markets, sales increased 83% in the fourth quarter. Because of service improvements during the quarter, the company's backlog dropped 21 million. 
This backlog attributed 47% of sales growth, leaving our sales increase of 36% without it. The U.S. and Canada sales force continue to embrace digital demonstration tools for more efficient and productive selling situations, and they are currently testing our new VTOP online party tool. Our product innovation continues to appeal to the consumer needs for preparing healthy food efficiently and reduce energy waste. We feature two products in the fourth quarter, including a two-speed hand mixer, which can whip and mix manually without use of electricity, and the hand sterilizer, which sterilizes vegetables quickly and easily. Tupperware Mexico contributed sales growth of 8% in the fourth quarter. Mexico grew 9% in average active sales force behind the increased use of mobile, mobile apps and a program of targeted promotions. During the quarter, products contributing strongly to sales included three on-the-go products, two new water bottles and an on-the-go coffee cup, demonstrating that our brand has permission to sell products outside just the food storage. In Brazil, sales increased 58%, which was achieved through a coordinated use of data, merchandising, products, and communication. The top future products in Brazil were similar to Mexico in the on-the-go category, including new water bottles and lunch kits. The entertaining category contributed strongly to sales in the fourth quarter as well. And lastly, a key market for us, China, declined 11%. A contributing factor was a decrease of 609 studios to end the year at around 5,700. We believe China could be a key growth driver for us as we plan to expand into new product categories and channels. We're happy to welcome our new president of China and Vietnam, Ken Yang, who joins us from PepsiCo. Prior to his time at PepsiCo, he led a number of businesses at JD.com and spent 10 years with Walmart before that. We believe Ken's experience will help us expand our retail studio presence in China, accelerate new product innovation, and increase focus on a transformational e-commerce strategy. As we move into 2021, we will accelerate our consumer-centric focus and in, all, in, in everything we do. With this in mind, we recently announced an inter internally that we are realigning our resources against priorities that will help us drive our future. To expand the availability of our products around the world and reach consumers where they choose to purchase, we've organized our commercial efforts into two streams, the traditional direct selling business and the new omnichannel business expansion. Patricio Cuesta, our worldwide commercial president, who has over 16 years of experience running direct selling markets and regions, will lead our direct selling business and will continue to focus on improving the core. This includes increased use of data analytics to help us make better decisions, pushing our digital transformation to create a seamless experience for our sales force to become more efficient and productive, and expansion into new products and categories, giving our sales force the opportunity to excite existing customers and attract new ones. With these efforts, we believe we can create a more sustainable and predictable business. Hector Lezama, President of Commercial Business Expansion, will lead our omnichannel strategy. He brings deep international experience in developing various business models that support and complement our direct selling model. I'm confident in the ability of our new leadership team to execute on our priorities. Our focus in 2021 will be to expand the skill set in the company to be more data-driven and explore new channels of distribution, avoiding a potential conflict with our current direct selling channel by introducing top or sub-brands and or penetrating into different product categories where we know the consumer gives us permission to enter. We believe the execution of these priorities will create meaningful value for our shareholders for years to come. Now let me turn the call over to Sandra Harris, our CFO and CEO, for a review of our financial statements. Thanks, Miguel. Our turnaround plan accelerated as we moved through 2020 and is now well underway. In 2020, we established a firm financial foundation by right-sizing the cost structure, refinancing the 2021 debt obligations, improving liquidity, centralizing the finance and accounting organization, and strengthening our control environment. Our fourth quarter sales improved 20% compared with last year. The majority of our markets posted improved sales in the quarter. North America increased 50%, South America increased 55%, and Europe increased 8%. Asia declined in the quarter down 5%. China was a major contributor. 
In the last three months, we have established new leadership in strategically important markets in Asia that we believe will drive future growth. The year started with weak sales trends from 2019 carrying into the first quarter, coupled with the most significant impacts of COVID-19, resulting in sales declines in the high teens for the first quarter, and a second quarter with high single-digit sales declines. In the second half, the pivot in the business was evident, with growth of 20% in both the third and fourth quarters, finishing the year 3% higher than 2019. If you exclude the net negative impact of COVID-19, revenues would have exceeded the prior year by 7%. We believe this performance is evidence that the actions of our turnaround plan are beginning to take hold. And with two months completed in the first quarter of 2021, we are seeing continued strong revenue growth in the low to mid-teens compared to our easiest comps in 2020. Turning now to profit. Gross margins in the quarter improved 500 basis points to 68.2%. 240 basis points were attributable to favorable manufacturing costs, reflecting efficiencies due to higher volumes. 220 basis points are reflective of our turnaround plan cost savings, and 40 basis points were from lower resin cost. SG&A, as a percentage of sales, was 54.1% in the quarter reflecting an improvement of 520 basis points year over year, reflecting the benefits from our right-sizing cost savings. This improvement is even more significant considering an increase in our bonus accrual due to progressively improved performance and higher distribution expenses primarily in the U.S. and Canada related to small package surcharges, small order sizes, and increased demand. Adjusted segment profit of $106 million, or 21.7% of sales, improved 1,090 basis points versus prior year of 10.8%. Three of our regions all achieved operating returns in excess of 25%, while North America, representing 31% of our revenues in the quarter, ended the quarter at a 10% return on sales, but delivering $15.4 million of profit versus a loss last year. The shift in country mix to lower margin regions can impact the overall company adjusted segment margins. Overall for the quarter, adjusted income before taxes improved over 189% to $68.1 million. Before I discuss EPS, let me take a few minutes to address the abnormally high tax rate, 72.9% effective rate for the quarter. As we noted during the Q3 call, we expected that our fourth quarter tax rate would be unusually high due to the timing of certain non-operating events associated with the sale of non-core assets and early retirement of debt. In the third quarter, our tax rate was lower due to the benefit from guilty credits and foreign tax credits used to offset the tax liability related to the gain on the debt extinguishment. The full-year effective tax rate of 47% improved significantly from the 88% in 2019. In 2020, our operating tax rate for the year was also 47%. As part of our turnaround plan, we have started the implementation of a five-year tax strategy that we expect will result in an overall effective tax rate for 2021 in the mid-30% range and even lower in 2022 you can expect some volatility in the ongoing operating tax rate within the quarters based on the timing of various non-core asset sales and country mix. Now to EPS. For the quarter, GAAP diluted EPS of $0.41 cents compared to a loss of $1.47 in 2019. The improvement is reflective of the benefits from the turnaround plan cost savings, profitable growth in the quarter, and a gain on sale of non-core assets partially offset by higher unallocated and operational expenses and taxes. Operationally, adjusted EPS was $0.14 cents versus a $0.69 cent loss last year. While we achieved our planned turnaround cost savings in the quarter, the quarter included $0.13 cents of incremental annual incentive plan accruals due to exceeding the original operating plan. Additionally, pandemic-related FedEx surcharges of $0.07 cents 
three cents for additional inventory reserves in Mexico, and 11 cents related to the absence of a China government grant normally received in the fourth quarter negatively impacted the EPS. We do expect that the grant will be received in the first quarter of 2021, albeit at a lower amount. Additionally, as mentioned, the quarter was heavily impacted by an unusually high tax rate. We indicated last quarter that at a sales level of $475 million, we would expect EPS in the range of $1 to $1.20 at an operating tax rate of 28%. We reassert that this is a normalized adjusted EPS for those assumptions. The items discussed above affected the quarter by $17 million or $0.34. Cents. If the current quarter's results were adjusted for these items, and at an operating tax rate of 28%, the EPS would have been higher by another $0.68, cents, delivering $1.16 versus the $0.14 cents adjusted EPS. Based on the timing of our tax strategy work, we anticipate we can achieve the assumed tax rate of 28% in 2022. Before we discuss the strength of our balance sheet, net income for 2020 was almost $100 million better than the prior year as we delivered $192 million of our $180 million planned turnaround cost savings goal. As a reminder, 75% of these cost savings are expected to annualize in 2021 as some of the savings were pandemic related and will be required to be reinvested to support 2021 sales growth. Let me now address improvements in liquidity and our efforts associated with strengthening our capital structure and reducing our debt. Free cash flow was $89 million in the quarter and $198 million year to date, representing a $137 million improvement over last year. Improved profitability and working capital were major contributors. We achieved an inventory turnover days improvement of 18, and the DSO improved to 21 from 24 in 2019. Additionally, the year included $59.4 million in proceeds from sale of non-core assets, partially offset by capital expenditures of $27.9 million. We do expect capital spending to return to normalized levels of 60 to $70 million in 2021 as we look to accelerate product innovation, and we therefore believe you can expect a 2021 free cash flow similar to 2020. In December, we successfully retired the remainder of our 600 million, 4.75% senior notes, with two 275 million term loans and cash on hand. At the end of the quarter, our debt balance was 702 million versus 875 million last year, and we ended 2020 with a debt to EBITDA ratio of 2.99 versus 3.61 last year, and well below our covenant requirement of 4.5. As part of our turnaround plan, we're committed to exiting and divesting non-core assets. Already in 2021, we completed the sale of Average Lane Beauty Business on February 26 for approximately $34 million, and we closed on the sale of a plant in France for $9.4 million U.S. dollar, with the receipt of proceeds spread through the third quarter of 2021. We will use the proceeds to eliminate debt, further strengthening our balance sheet. On February 12th, we filed an 8K regarding our ongoing plans to divest of excess non-core land in Orlando. We continue to work with the O'Connor Group or others on divesting the remaining Orlando real estate valued at approximately $40 million. We believe that the results reported today provide proof that our initial efforts to turn around the company are working, restoring growth to our core business, right-sizing the company, and strengthening our balance sheet to support future growth. As a result, we believe we are creating a stronger, more competitive company for the future. I will now turn the call back to Miguel for another update. Thanks, Sandra. Today we also announced the appointment of three new board members effective March 15th. We're excited to add these new three members whose strengths and experiences we believe will improve our ability to successfully execute our three-year growth strategy. I will now turn the call back over to Pierre 
Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Your first question comes from the line of Linda Baldenweiser from DA Davidson. You may now ask your question. Hi, how are you? Congratulations on a strong quarter. Um, I guess my first question has to do with um, top line growth, which was very strong in the quarter, and it, it did exceed our expectations. However, it did slow a bit from the third quarter, and it looks like mainly Europe was the area where the growth actually slowed. Can you talk about whether that was pandemic closures or any particular market in Europe and also Asia? was a little was kind of worse than in the third quarter as well. So was that something other than China in Asia? Thank you. Hi Linda, thanks. Yeah, this is Sandra. Um so for Europe, the difference between Q3 and Q4 was predominantly related to B2B business. Um, in Q3, we had almost $11 million of, of B2B that did not um, happen in, in Q4. And so that's the largest difference in Europe. Um, if you actually looked at the core business, the growth was relatively the same. Um, and, and the profitability also improved in, in Europe. And then you know, for um, APAC, and, and maybe I'll let Miguel expand upon what we're doing there. Yes, China had an impact, but we still do, um, you know, have some some continued um, challenges in, in other parts of Asia, specifically, you know, in Indonesia, um, and in both locations, you know, we've made strategic choices on leadership. So I'll turn that over to Miguel to talk about what we're doing in Asia. Yeah. Well, hi, hi Linda. So, so as, as Sandra was saying, you know, we we're facing challenges in various markets in in, in APAC. We, we recently announced uh, leadership changes pretty much in, in the biggest markets in APEC. I think uh, there were four of them or five of them. Uh, the other big market got in, in APEC that got impacted by COVID was Philippines because, as you know, we have a, a mainly a, a retail type of, a, of model, and those are the ones that, were, that got hit uh, greatly by, by COVID. Uh, but um, other than that, we were consistent with our strategy of, uh, and the one that we've been talking about and the one that we have in other countries that we know that are working, we just need to have the right players so we can a execute it properly in, in those countries. Okay, thank you. And then um, can you just talk about, I mean, you've talked about um, kind of going a little bit more to a good, better, best pricing strategy to capture more consumers. Um, are you implementing that kind of, starting out in 2021, and if so, um, you know, would that be expected to impact gross margin in 2021? You had very good gross margin performance, you know, here in the fourth quarter. So kind of what can we expect along those, you know, in that line in, the, in 2021? So we, we, already, we already started with some pilots around the world, and, and we, we've seen a lot of uh, – positive uh, momentum and positive uh, response. Obviously, uh, in some cases, the gross margin gets a little bit lower, but we've been able to offset it even more with a higher volume. So one important factor is that the sales force ends up making, you know, a lot more money even, uh, you know, with the, with the same amount of efforts, which, is, which was key, key for us. And with achieving, you know, these new price points, we're actually – becoming more relevant because our products are getting into hands of more consumers in, in every single experiment or pilot that we did around the world. So this is something that got us very excited and we're going to continue to do. And obviously we're learning through the path, uh, but, uh, but very excited with, that, with the pilots that we've run so far. Okay, thank you. And then um, you've done really great on the cost reduction in 2020, and your, your margins have come around very nicely really across the board. Um, are there additional actions that you're looking at? I mean, you've talked about being able to maintain margins kind of going forward, but are there additional actions that you're kind of looking at um, longer term, and are you looking at more like ongoing productivity or maybe another cost reduction program, or what, what's kind of the thought there? Thank you. 
Yeah, so Linda, um, you know, what we talked about is that 75% of the cost savings would carry into 2021 and annualize. The other 25% were largely related to the furlough programs and other, um, you know, reductions in travel and incentive trips and things of that nature that will start to come back on as, as we start to see some relief from COVID. So we did assume that, you know, 25% of that would come back into the business's cost for 2021. Um, you know, the other thing that I think we've reiterated is that we do need to invest in the business, and so you know, our intentions are that we're um, carrying forward that cost savings and that future um, investments that we're making in the business, and we, we do need to make investments in our you know, continued digital strategies. It's really what contributed to the growth in the quarter and, for, you know, quite frankly, the last half of this year. Um, you know, we have investments that we want to make to continue offering great products that excite consumers and you know we'll also be working through you know other investments that are you know focused on this new business expansion that we're working on with that said, we are very committed to continuing our efforts. We, we realize that the SG&A percent is still very high, and so you know, we're continuing to um, focus on leveraging throughout the business where we can. Um, we have a global business services initiative that we've been working on as we started to separate the back-end functions from the front-end functions. And you know, we're starting to stand those up in, in three different geographies around the world, and we do expect that we'll be able to you know, skill the organization at a more efficient and effective cost and leverage costs across the, the board. Um, we also know that we had challenges this year in supply chain. And so we're committed to, you know, to the extent we can, the whole world is being impacted by the FedEx surcharges. And so, you know, those types of things we can't necessarily affect, but what we can do is become more efficient and effective um, within our distribution footprint, within our manufacturing footprint, and we'll continue to look for opportunities to optimize um, in that way. The other thing, and um, you know, I'll see if Miguel wants to expand on it further, but you know, we're also looking at segmenting um, our customer set, right, and offering different promotional cadences um, between what a preferred buyer is uh, versus a business builder, and you know, that will also have a, an impact on our, our margins as we offer different promotions to the different segments of our, our business. So, Miguel, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, everything is based out of our segmentation strategy. Uh, with the use of data, we're you know, understanding who's here for the business and who's here for the product. And with that knowledge, we've been able to segment uh, promotions, which obviously the return of, the, of those investments is way higher. So you can argue that uh, a good way to, to lower an sg and is by increasing the top line and being more, a lot more sophisticated in the whole promotion strategy that we are carrying around the company. And that's, again, that's one of the things that uh, has been uh, getting a lot of traction, and we see a lot of promising results in the, in the initial efforts that we've done around the markets. And then, Linda, one final comment. You know, historically, we've noted that our B2B businesses are more profitable. Um, and you know, as we move toward more business expansion um, in our business, you know, we do anticipate that, in general, those would deliver a higher margin. Great, thank you. And then finally, um, <clears throat> do you have an outlook for your plastic resin costs in 2021? Yeah, we are seeing some slight increases in uh, resin costs. You know, we anticipate that we can offset those through other cost savings um, throughout the supply chain and or through pricing in specific markets. Um, they're, they're relatively, you know, small single-digit increases, but we are seeing some increases in resin. Okay, thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Steve O'Hara with um, Sudani and Company. Your line's open. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, I, I was hoping uh, just in terms of the uh, free cash flow outlook for next year, um, is that just um, – I just want to make sure I understand what you're including in that. It's uh, kind of operating cash flow and then, you know, any disposals on uh, – property and, and so forth, uh, less CapEx, is that what the calculation is? Yes, the free cash flow is our operating cash flow net of investing, so it would include, it include all the cash flows coming from operations. And then, you know, as I noted um, in the commentary, we do expect to return to a more normal capital expenditure level. So, um, you know, we, we spent roughly $28 million this year, and, you know, we intend to go back to somewhere around 60 to, to $70 million in 2021. Um, but yet we still do believe that through our continued work on working capital and also through the growth of the company and the operating cash flow improvement, 
that we can deliver, you know, roughly around where we ended this year, you know, in that 200 million range. Okay, and, and then uh, just on the, um, you know, the outlook for divestitures, things like that. I mean, what are you baking in next year for that, uh, or for this year, I guess, for uh, on that line? Yeah, so I'll, I'll reaffirm our commitment. I mean, we, we want to focus on our core business. So, um, you know, we, we made the announcement that we successfully divested um, in 2021 of Average Lane. We continue to look at all of our non-core assets, um, even, you know, our real estate, which we'll continue to make efforts on. You know, we have learned that, obviously, um, it's unpredictable as to when transactions can close, especially in a COVID world. There's a lot of, uh, you know, administrative right. work that delays timelines around uh, those. And so, you know, at this, at this juncture, it's still part of our strategy and our goal, um, but we, we haven't necessarily predicted the timing around the remaining um, sell of the land here in Orlando, uh, nor future divestitures. Um, okay. Okay, that's that's fair. Um, and, and then just wanted to jump back to the uh, unallocated expenses. Um, I think you laid out, you know, kind of what was in there. Um, but could you just remind me, uh, just on the adjusted, it looks like, uh, you know, it's $30.3 million, um, and that's up, you know, obviously about almost 3x from last year. And, and I'm just kind of curious what what's in there exactly. And, and, I mean, is that, you know, what's the right way to think about unallocated going forward? Yeah, so one of the, the largest components year over year of that is that, you know, obviously based on the performance this year, um, we are able to pay out our annual incentive program, which is something that hasn't been done in over two years for Tupperware. So, um, you know, the performance became evident during the, the second half, and, and we had to modify, you know, quickly our reserves, which is why there was a 13 cent impact on EPS in the fourth quarter of this year versus last year for that annual incentive plan. Um, so that's you know, probably the biggest increase. We have made investments in uh, more in the unallocated area as we separated the back end from the front end. So you heard the announcement um, of you know, the commercial leaders uh, like Patricio and, and Hector. And so we are building you know, centers of excellence around digital and other items that would fall in unallocated. Uh, but over time, that cost you know, would come back out of the markets as we, we work on a more standardized approach for that. So those are really the, the two biggest components, I think, in unallocated. And, you know, we, we hope and anticipate that our annual incentive plan continues. <laughs> um, and, and obviously, right. on a, on a go-forward basis, that would be built into our, our 2021 um, you know, numbers as we develop that. It was just something that was not expected as we entered into this year, and so it was a delta. Okay, okay. Um, and, and Okay, so, yeah, I mean, I guess um, does it make sense to think about that line as, you know, kind of a – percent of sales or segment profit or, you know, I mean, 32 million in 2019 is 60 this year. I mean, is something kind of splitting the difference, you know, maybe the better way to think about it in terms of, you know, if results improve in, in 2021, you get more performance-based comp and things like that and, and growth initiatives. Is that, you know, maybe not as high as this year because of the, the step up where the accrual was, you know, behind yeah, I mean, I can tell you that traditionally, you know, obviously we've reported the unallocated as the Tupperware method. I would tell you that my focus is more on the SG&A, um, since the majority of that unallocated sits in our SG&A numbers. So the fact that, you know, this year we continue to improve our SG&A, um, you know, for the quarter, last year was at 59.3%. We dropped to 54.1%. And and then, um, you know, it, and, and for the full year, we've also had improvement from 55.6 to 54.5. So, again, we, we've acknowledged before that being in that 50% range is not where we'd like to be. So we'll continue to make efforts on that, and unallocated is a part of that. And so we're balancing this now on a global basis versus where in the past, you know, that un unallocated was largely what was considered worldwide, but we're looking at it from a holistic global perspective of continuing to optimize our cost. Okay. Um, and, I mean, it, you know, you know, you said, uh, um, you know, 50% range isn't where you want to be. I mean, is there, what's kind of the long-term thinking around where that could get to, you know, if everything's operating, um, you know, as you, you hope and, and maybe, uh, you know, I don't know if, you, you know, peers or you know, what range peers are in, but, I mean, is there a way to think about that, you know, longer term, um, what level that SG&A could get to? 
Yeah, and I think I, I may have said it in the past, Steve, but I mean, over a you know, three to five year period, we anticipate that we get into the 40s. That's where we would like to be um, and not, not hanging out in the 50s. But you know, we are going to reinvest in the business. And so we're trying to balance that as we reinvest and make those you know, digital investments, the, the investments we're making in the segmentation work. And so you know, we, we would like to be in the 40s over, over our strategic long-term plan period, but we're going to balance that so that we can continue to grow this business on the top line. Okay, great. Uh, and then maybe just last on the, I think last quarter you guys noted some supply chain issues, um, but I didn't hear, I mean, it sounded like, uh, you know, you guys fulfilled the backlog in North America and that was a, a, a boost. So did something happen kind of intra-quarter that relieved those issues or are there still supply chain issues going forward, but maybe they're less acute? Yeah, no, we're excited that we were able to make significant progress on our backlog. Um, again, you know, the backlog was created by, by basically three reasons. I mean, one, the increase in demand was, you know, outside of what we had been able to forecast and predict. That's, that's really positive. Um, the other thing is that just within our distribution network, you know, the change in the business model and also, you know, to meet the backlog, and this is what caused the increase in distribution expense, um, is that, you know, we – we're shipping whenever it became available. So since the demand created product shortages, we were shipping more packages as soon as we could get them to ensure that we continue to delight our sales force. Um, and so, you know, that that's something that, that added to it. And then, you know, the other piece of the backlog is just investing in new leadership and new talent in the supply chain that understand, you know, what consumers want and how we need to, you know, uh, improve every day in our distribution centers on the efficiencies of how we pick, pack, and ship. And so, um, you know, that new leadership came on board early in the fourth quarter, and, you know, you saw the results that $21 million of the backlog got shipped in the fourth quarter. And so, you know, we continue to see those efficiencies and improvements happening as we invested in that new leadership. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Steve. Your next question comes from the line of Wendy Nicholson with um, CD Bank. You may now ask your question. Hi, good morning. Um, first two questions, just housekeeping. Um, Sandra, did you offer us sort of a target tax rate for 2021? Yes, I did. It was. Um, we, we're going to be in the the mid 30s, is what we're predicting for 2021. Got it. Perfect. Sorry about that. And then just regarding okay. the dividend, I know you suspended that, um, which made sense, but obviously you've made huge progress on debt pay down. Any plans to reinstate the dividend? Yeah, our priority right now, Wendy, you know, we have um, obviously we're excited about the turnaround plan. As part of the turnaround plan, you know, our goal was to right size this business and also start to grow the top line. So our, our first priority is reinvesting in the business. And so we'll do that. You know, with the sale of the non core assets, um, we're committed to paying down our debt even further. So we've made tremendous progress on our overall debt load. You know, obviously improving our leverage ratio every day, but we'd like to become a much healthier, you know, company from that that perspective. And so, you know, we've committed, um, and also the term loans obviously have a higher interest uh, burden on them. So, you know, as we sell the non-core assets, our, our focus there is to start to pay down the debt, and then, you know, hopefully we'll, you know, renegotiate that to a, a healthier level at the the right point in time. Once we do those two, then we're absolutely open to looking at, you know, concepts of share buybacks or or, or dividends. But, um, you know. So it would be in that order. Fair enough. Okay, thanks. And then, um, Miguel, for you, maybe sort of bigger picture strategic question, um, just thinking about, you know, the benefit that the business clearly saw during COVID and, and some of the things that you're, you're working on in terms of new products and, and, and all of that good stuff. Just as we think kind of high level about a revenue outlook um, for 2021, I know you don't want to give too much in the way of guidance at this point, but is there any reason we shouldn't think of kind of close to $2 billion as a reasonable top line forecast for 2021, um, just, just taking the puts and takes of some tough comps in some markets, all that kind of good stuff, but, but, but high level, are, are we still running at that kind of 480, 490 in sales per per quarter in your in your mind. So so Wendy, you're not going to like my answer, but because you know that we don't we're not giving guidance. But what I can tell you is that the things that we implemented, the ones that you know, investing in digital and making sure that there's adoption there, we're as, as Sandra said, we're investing in that. We're investing in new products. We're investing in the brand. We're investing in in the, in the data, and all those things are are getting traction. Uh, 
so uh, so we are very confident and feel really good about all the things that we are inputting into the system. Um, obviously, obviously for the last part of the year we have a different difficult comps, but overall for a, a big strategic uh, uh, point of view, we we're we're in co we're on course. We're you know we're we're exactly where we want to be, probably even a little bit ahead of where we we expected to be at the very beginning. Uh, so we're very excited about the future, and um, and, uh, and that I, I guess that's it. Yeah, and Wendy, uh, just to reiterate what I said um, is that you know for for the first two months we are seeing the the um, low to mid teens in the first quarter, but that is our easiest comp of the year. Um, and so as we go throughout the year, we would expect that those comps get much more difficult. But you know that's where we're tracking at this juncture. And can you? And again, I I, I don't mean to push, but just in terms of maybe in the U.S. where there are some parts of the country that are really kind of back to normal for the most part. Um, people have gone back to work. People are back in school, et cetera, et cetera. Can you talk about or Do you have any visibility into those areas or those regions? Are, are your sales still running up that strongly? I'm just, I'm, I, I think bottom line, what we're all worried about or thinking about is as people go back to their normal day jobs, you know, is, is, are they going to leave their part-time job selling Tupperware. So, so, so that's kind of what we're all thinking about. So, so let me just, uh, uh, let me tell you something so hopefully, you know, it helps. One of the key reasons why we, we experienced this uh, great growth in the, during last year was obviously the difference, difference in consumer behavior, but also the adoption of digital tools for, from our sales force. And, uh, and as you've heard me saying before, this is like the horse and the car. Once people start trying the car and they saw that it was safer, it went fa further, faster, they never went back to, to the horse. So it's the same with a lot of uh, segments of our sales force. They're using our new tools, they're falling in love with the new tools, and they realize that they're more productive and efficient. So there's no, there's no reason why they would go back to the old uh, way of doing business. And that's, uh, that's why we keep on investing and saying about the, you know, the digital world, because that's that actually improves the whole top of our proposition into any market, not only the U.S., uh, because with less effort, you can actually earn more from the sales point, point of view. Fair enough. That's hugely helpful. Thank you so much. And we have a follow-up question from Steve O'Hara with um, Sidoni and Company. Your line's open. Yeah, thanks for taking the, the follow-up. Um, uh, going back to uh, free cash flow, forecast for 2021 um, I, I'm just curious uh, I, I'm not sure does your guidance include you know some level of disposals or does that guidance for free cash flow uh, only include the capbacks yeah, so I'll just say it again that on the divestiture side of any of our businesses, you know, at this point we have not predicted the timeline associated with that. We're still focused on it, uh, but we're, we're not necessarily including, um, you know, any any type of proceeds from continued um, divestitures, other than other than the ones that you know we talked about. I mean, obviously, Average Lane fell into 2021, so uh, we provided that number at around 34 million of proceeds, and then we did have um, the sale of, of a French uh, manufacturing site in February, and it was roughly around. 9 million, but that cash proceeds will come, um, you know, over the course of, of three quarters, which is what we agreed to with, with the potential acquirer. So we closed the deal. It's just the 9 million would come over three quarters. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, that concludes um, the, the q and session of today's call. I'll hand the call back over to, Mike, uh, to Miguel Fernandez for final remarks. Thank you. I am pleased that we finished 2020 stronger than initially expected. I feel confident that we are now entering into the foundational stage of our turnaround plan, where we can begin executing our vision for the company. We expect to build a consumer-centric company, one that is stronger, more resilient, with the right processes, technologies, and mindsets in place to expand our iconic brand into the future. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, presenters, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on today's call. Can we now disconnect?